for various listening levels. My name is Trudy Stevens. I'm going to try and avoid that feedback if I get further back because I don't um, As a member of the PCC, I'm chairing this afternoon. For the few people here that are not familiar with St Mary's, I can just indicate that there are toilets through the doors, the link doors, end of the corridor, turn right, and there's one either side of the corridor there. Exits, so there's an exit through that link corridor and also the door that you came in, but we're not expecting to have a fire or anything in the hope this afternoon, thank you very much. So, as I say, welcome to St Mary's. This very ancient church has been a place of prayer for centuries. But of course, like all old buildings, it's in constant need of upkeep and repair. We are unusual in as much as we have one of the few round towers in Essex. However, the tower that it supports is a very useful restaurant for local repairs. When damaged shingles were replaced, the new ones just provided a merely tasty fresh food, which the birds have seemed to be enjoying as the work and actually left. In seeking to raise the necessary money to replace the entire spire with metal-backed oak shing tiles, one of our ventures has been to run this series of talks and tours, exploring different aspects of the history of this beautiful place. And the first of those was held in September 2018, nearly five years ago. Much has happened since then. Thanks to a grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we've been able to start work on replacing, repairing the, the spire roof and repointing the tower. But unfortunately, um, the, fund has also, unfortunately the fund has also wanted us to develop our project to enhance our community involvement. And so what Project Rutherford was born. In this, we are focusing on the artistic work of Rosemary Rutherford, whose father was vicar of this church for many years. During his time, she created the beautiful fresco that is housed within the round tower. I hope you'll go and take a look at that after the talk. And to much of our stained glass windows. Rosemary was a skilled East Anglian artist whose work has been long neglected. So we're creating an exhibition about her, focusing particularly on her church artistry and concerning her fresco and also developing the internal space of the tower to be used as a quiet place for reflection and meditation. Although fully funded at the initial stage, building work on the tower and spire has been for complications. Once the shingles and battens were removed, the integrity of the ancient timbers was revealed as being in less than ideal state, with rather Heath Robinson repairs following one damage in the war. The bill to restore this is amounting to an extra £85,000. A number of charities have already kindly donated and we've raised 55000 of this now, but there's still about 30000 to go. A problem with the scaffolding design has further complicated the work, causing it to be stopped in November, and the scaffolding has to be remodelled before the builders can resume work. The work problems with the, the plans that were built, that were designed, we are absolutely delighted that the scaffolders are finally back on site, starting on Monday, even working today, which we did not expect, and we're hoping that that will mean that carpenters can get back in, continue repairing the, the timbers of the spire, of all the battens and the furrings, and then the shingles get to be replaced with shakes and our spire is safe once more. This is now scheduled to be finished approximately the beginning of May. Given it was meant to have finished last October, you can appreciate it's been rather a headache for a number of months. I think the coming out ceremony when that does finally occur will be a great celebration for a lot of people, not just us. To move on, however, though, plan of this afternoon. I'm going to shortly introduce our speaker, Chris Parkinson. If anybody finds difficulty in hearing, we do have a loop system here, so please make sure that your um, devices are accordingly switched on or whatever. Um, please do indicate if you cannot hear, just by raising a hand. We will be monitoring and effectively putting up the mic if somebody is finding difficulty. So please do let us know 
that's really important that you can hear. We're trying to stop the feedback. There seems to be a bit of a feedback between the lepton mic and this mic, which is why I've stepped back a bit. And that seems to be a better than it was last month. Um, Chris is happy to answer any questions at the end of this talk, and then there'll be an opportunity to look around the church and at the various windows. We do have a paper guide, and there are a number of church members that will show you around if you are interested in looking. Refreshments will also be available in the church hall, which is through the link corridor doors. And please do go and have a cup of tea afterwards. The Keating's been on for quite a while in the church, but it still does smack a little bit cool, doesn't it? Um, it might be useful if half of you went through and gave some nice warm tea, while the other half looked around the church and then swapped over, so we're not having too long queues for the, the tea afterwards. Of course, we have the ubiquitous raffle, which Neil has been counting for us, and all money raised today will be going towards our Spire and Exhibition Fund. I will flag up that we have some lovely bookmarks now available on the stained glass windows, and these are available for a pound, and also details of our beautiful altar window, which is available for 20p if you're interested. The talks that we've been given, we are getting published and there will be one on the stained glass window that is envisaged. And these are available 750 and eight pounds, the past talks that we have had. So do have a look at those if you are interested in what's been going on here. And in the future, look out for the stained glass and other window books that will be made available. But let's get on to the important session this afternoon. It's my very great pleasure in introducing Chris Parkinson, our speaker. So Chris sent me a little biopic, absolutely fascinating. While at university, Chris began his interest in 19th century stage glass and, like many others, was bewildered by the large number of windows from that period, many of which were unsigned. In the succeeding decades, he built up a large database of images to help identify the stylistic features and changes over time of 19th century stained glass firms. To understand where the Victorians were coming from, Christopher started to look up more closely at stained glass from earlier centuries, and in 2009 was approached by the Corpus Vitrium Medii Aegai, an academic research group, who undertake a photographic survey of the remaining medieval and renaissance glass remaining in Essex. On completion of this survey, he was then asked by the CBMA to prepare for publication a catalogue of such glass with the assistance of the respected stained glass historian, Dr. Penny Hegbin Barnes. It is decided to cover glass up to 1800 and to use this old county, or the old county boundary for Essex. So glass now in the eastern London boroughs could be included. So that's absolutely fascinating, Chris. You're going to give us a talk this afternoon on stained glass and rosemary Margaret. I hand over to you. Thanks. Uh, first of all, the microphone's working. You can hear me right at the back. Yes, good. Right. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon. Um, I moved to Essex oh, about 40 years ago, and I had my trusty little Pevsner, and Broomfield was always a fascinating church for me, mainly because it had these wonderful words, Four Windows by Rosemary Rutherford. Now, I tried coming a few times, but sadly the church was locked, and for about five years I taught at uh, Rainsford High School, you may remember, so sure they're no longer there, and uh, spent many a uh, oh, Useless afternoon, I'll say, at a, uh, a Broomfield place, which was an education centre there. But I really wanted to come and look at this window. So it was a delight last year when Neil uh, approached me at the Echo Records office and said, Would you like to come to St Mary's and have a look at the glass and photograph it? And I said, Yes, I'd love to. So along I came, and there I met Ross at the inn, and we got talking, and we decided it would be nice to actually do a talk on stained glass. So that is how today of course. But what I will do is actually divide the talk into four parts. In the first part, which will be very brief, I'll just talk a bit about what glass is and how a stained glass window is made. We'll then look at the work 
of uh, women designers of the 20th century up to about 1950 when Rosemary Rutherford We'll then have a section looking at Rosemary Rutherford's glass, and then we'll finish by looking at uh, glass produced by women designers uh, after Rosemary's death up to the present day. Um, I chose women deliberately as the subject, women designers, because obviously there are lots of men, but if I was to include men, it would become a huge sprawling talk. And then, as you'll see, women paint a very significant part of I mean, probably the, uh, the more significant part in stained glass design uh, in the early part of this century. So I think it's only right that uh, we just look at women today. And this talk is a sort of homage to all the lady women stained glass designers that uh, have been in the past and all the ones that are working today. Um, you might have some saying women and ladies. I was a little bit nervous in today's um, world climate as to what to say, whether to say women, ladies, people born without a Y chromosome, or, uh, or whatever. Um, and I did uh, consult various people. I consulted Neil, what's the records office view? And he says, oh, whatever you want. Then I did uh, talk to some academic, I even talked to a professor of uh, English at Sydney University. He said, oh, just use women. So, I will use women, and if I am offending anyone, then I'm sorry. But first of all, the technical bit. Um, glass. Here is a glass speaker. Um, how do we make glass? Well, glass is basically sand, pure sand, which is molten um, to a liquid and then allowed to cool, and then the yellow sand turns to transparent glass. Now, unfortunately, you would need to put your sand in the oven at gas mark 40,000 or something, or you would have to increase the temperature to 1700 degrees to actually get it to melt. Now that would have taken an awful lot of energy and back in medieval times they didn't have the facilities to reach such high temperatures. So to the glass is added a chemical called flux. And what flux does is it significantly reduces the temperature at which glass melts to something under a thousand degrees. The trouble is then that the glass that's produced is not very durable and very weak. In fact, you could take that glass and pour some water into it, and the water would dissolve the glass, so not much use. So the next thing you add is a stabiliser, and what the stabiliser does is improve the properties. Now, flux, for instance, would be chemicals like potash or soda. The stabiliser would be calcium oxide. Uh, sometimes you can add litharge, which is lead oxide, and that gives you your lead crystal glass. Now, to get the coloured glass into the mixture of flux, sand and stabiliser, you would put in metal oxides, which, when molten, would produce your colours. For instance, cobalt would produce blues, the rubies, ruby reds, um, often gold is used for that. So that would produce your coloured glass. Um, uh, the <coughs> to actually make the glass is a very complex and uh, very difficult procedure, and that is why, back in medieval times, making of glass was done by the guilds, and they kept their methods extremely secret. Um, there was a monk called um, Philoctus, I think, um, way back in the 12th, 13th century, and he did do a treatise on glass, and he did say that if you wanted to make red glass, you had to put some urine in the mixture, but not ordinary urine. You had to find a red headed boy, a virgin who was four years old. You had to use this one. Now, yes, you can see there was an awful lot of uh, sort of black magic cream on the water, but that was the um, way to make the glass. So, that is basically what glass is. And the coloured glass has just got some um, uh, metal oxide added to it. Now, to make the glass window, the first thing we would do is. The first thing you do is you go to your um, designer, talk it over with them in the window, and they will produce a bit of watercolour sketch, which is called a vividness. And on the left there, you can see a vividness for a window which is at a curving sofa. Um, it looks as though the congregation couldn't make up their mind whether they wanted a red background or a blue background to the same. So 
Um, Alfred Ford and Shaw, he did the both on his diagram, or his sketch rather. And then when the window was made on the right, um, obviously they chose the blue background. Now once that design has been um, agreed, the next step is to produce what is called a cartoon. And a cartoon is a full-size drawing of the window, done on cartridge paper with charcoal um, lines to show where the um, glass will go. Now this is another one by Alfred uh, Wilkinson, but what Alfred did, which lots of other designers didn't do, he actually coloured in his cartoons as well, probably so you can see his little green wings and so forth. And that is just one part of the cartoon, and there on the left is the whole cartoon. And I brought that along today for you to have a look at, and it's just in the later chapter around the corner, so when the talk's over, do go on and have a look at it. Um, sadly, somewhere, or the other, um, that bit's gone missing. It's in my office somewhere, so we've got uh, about three quarters of it, the one bit there's missing. And on the right is the actual window when it was made, which is a pigment step. Now, going back to the cartoon, the artist, once it was produced, he would then get uh, bits of coloured glass, and this coloured glass was called hot metal. They would be cut, um, perhaps we go back one. Um, um, there are, we'll use that one. <laughs> he would get bits of uh, fragments of the coloured glass, and he would place them on top, mm -hmm. and he wouldn't stick them together, he would just put them there. Then the next thing he would do, is or she would do, would be to get some uh, black paint, not too much paint, but um, special paint made from copper oxide or iron oxide. And this black paint would be painted onto the glass, so it could be things like the eyes, the nose, mouths, um, lines in the drapery, and what have you. And if you look at uh, this window here, um, there we are, that one there, you can see that we've got bits of coloured glass, and on it are painted these black lines for the um, face there, um, the lines on the there. And if you wanted to get shading, then you would use a badger hairs brush, dip it in the paint, just, oops, sorry, and just dab it on the uh, on the glass to give you your shading. These would then go in the kiln, they would then come out of the kiln, and they would be inspected. If they were no good, the glass would be flown or thrown back into the general bottle molten glass, and they would be done again until everything was set and okay. The next thing was that these bits of lead, painted um, glass fragments, sorry, will be leaded up with strips of lead called carbons, carbons sorry, and a panel will be made. Onto these bits of lead would also be soldered tiny strips of uh, wire. The panel would then be brought along to the church, and again, if you look at this window here, um, can you see there's these horizontal bars going across? Now, they're not part of the they're oh, not part of the same glass rather. They're actually part of the window. They're actually set into the mullions and um, form horizontal supports. And the wire that had been soldered onto the leg would then be wrapped around this bar, and that is all that's holding the glass in place. You would put a bit of putty around the edge just to make it uh, waterproof, but the actual panel is held in place with these bits of wire. And as you go around the church afterwards, you know, do go up and really look closely. It is fairly dark, but you can probably just see the wire wrapped around. So that is basically how we make uh, the stained glass window. Now, that one we've seen, here are some pictures of a stained glass studio um, in London. This is the Power Studio. And in this picture, uh, taken in 1920, you can see people are actually preparing the cartoons. In this one, the glass has uh, been put on the cartoons, has been sort of held in place very loosely, uh, probably by a lead or um, copper wire, but just held in place so that it can be held upright. And we see the artist there actually painting the black paint lines on it. Once that had been put in the kiln and fired, come out and checked, the next step was to go to the glazier's shop, and there you'd see the glaziers actually putting the fragments into the panel, fixing them with the lead carbons. And very quickly, two ways, the old ways of making glass, the muff method, you would have your big vat of molten glass, stick your blow pipe in, you would um, put a block of glass on the end, 
blow it, roll it to form a uh, tube. Uh, the tube would then be cut off at the top and bottom, so you have a cylinder. The cylinder then will be split and uh, pressed flat, and there's your piece of um, stain, uh, piece of colour glass. Notice that it's not very big, and that's why when we look at stained glass windows, they're made out of lots and lots of little fragments. We just didn't have big, big sheets of glass until really Victorian times. The other method, uh, the sheet or pan method, really the same, but instead of blowing a cylinder, you blow a flat disc, which is then cut off. The only disadvantage of this is that you get the sort of bullseye in the middle there, which you sometimes see in hot windows. So, technical bit over, let's have a look at the glass up to uh, Rosewood's time. Now, in the 19th century, or rather before we get there, um, I attended a talk late last year at, um, uh, at uh, this was a chance at Christchurch. It was uh, given by the Essex um, Society of Archaeology and History. And one of the speakers was talking about engra um, engravers who were at Walthamstow. And uh, one of the interesting things they said was that uh, their daughters would be doing engraving work at home. So during the interview I said, um, is this was as usual for uh, women to be working in this trade? And she said, well, yes, it was so, okay because they'd be working from home. They wouldn't be going through the streets or working with rough men in, in factories. So I would imagine the same applied to stained glass, that uh, women could work at home, produce figure nine, could produce cartoons, which would then be sent off to the um, factories and made into windows. And what we have here are three windows made by men's women that are in Cambridgeshire. Um, the one in the middle, you can see, is uh, completely different. Um, I think with that one, probably uh, Mrs. Walker, who made that for language, <coughs> she probably produced the, um, the Vidalus, the cartoon, and that went to the um, factory. I think it's a leeches, that one. And they then cut the glass and made it up. But there were women around in the sort of mid-19th century. But by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, we start getting women in the big factories. And at Powell's, one lady there was called Ada Curry. Um, this is a window you can see she produced at uh, Netherswell, um, just outside Harlow. Um, here is a, another window of hers. Um, this one's at Downton. Um, we think she was probably very well respected <laughs> because um, when she went there, she was on one shilling an hour. That was her wage, one shilling an hour. And that went up to one and three after about um, two or three years. Another lady, a Miss Harrison, took 21 years to get to the one man who did it. So, um, you know, Ada certainly had to do something about her. But Howells were producing this, these types of windows, which were very much in the aesthetic style throwback to when Henry Holiday was their chief designer. And really it didn't allow much creativity for the individual designers and artists to express their views. Uh, just out of interest, the window over there we've been looking at, that is also by Powell's. Um, you can tell because in the bottom right hand corner there, there's a little monk. That was their symbol they used. And the one behind the screen is another one that's made by Powell's as well. But by now, we're looking at, ooh, well into the 20th century, we've lost this sort of um, quasi pre raphaelite Edward Burns-Jones look, and the artists are now becoming more self-expressive. Um, it really wasn't until the end of the 19th century that a lady called Mary Lowndes came along. Now, Mary Lowndes was a pupil of Christopher Wall, who was the natural successor to um, really William Morris, and he founded this movement which is now called the Arts and Crafts. Now Mary Lowndes uh, was a pupil of his, and uh, she was encouraged to um, produce some stained glass windows. And this is some windows which are actually stretch over about uh, 15 years or so, but you can see immediately they're totally different from the ones that we were looking at uh, a few seconds ago, and your typical Victorian fair. Um, Mary's glass is uh, sort of dominated by these strong, rich colours, the blues and the purples, 
and the way she's drawn the figures, especially the second on the left, you've got, I think it's Joseph and someone sort of bending over the baby. These were sort of figurative designs that were used by um, the pre Raphaelites, Morris and uh, the Swiss Queen Patrick's there before. So they're using sort of pre Raphaelite um, designs as such, but the glass was totally different. Um, here is another one, this one's at West Mersey, and this one I think probably is the Ascension. You've got the um, gentleman on the, or the angel on the uh, left with her face coming out of his ears. But to my eyes, um, the predominant colours there is like blues, whites, and greens. The green, I'm afraid, doesn't really show up well with the projectors and the digital cameras. But when you stand in front of this window, the green is uh, pretty dominant. And as I say, those three colours are quite significant because Mary Lowndes was a leading member of the women's suffrage movement. Um, she did a lot of design work for their banners and what have you. And the colours of the women's suffrage were, of course, um, well, we've got purple for loyalty and for dignity, white for purity, and green for hope. Now, I'm not for one minute saying that she deliberately put those colours in there because she was a suffragette, but I would love to go back in time and ask her whether this was something that she did deliberately or whether it was something subconscious or what have you. But certainly the suffragist colours feature in that window. Um, this is a later figure of Mary's. This is a snake. Um, again, beautiful use of colours, uh, beautiful stained glass windows. But I think probably some of the vitality of her youth has been lost. She's much more sort of mainstream. And this is something you see with lots of artists. Um, um, think of what their early work is like. Um, we just mentioned the um, pre Raphaelites. Millet, for instance, was doing really strong, wonderful designs in his youth, but as he got older, he went all sorts of poetry box for, for people and things like that. And you know, Mary still could you know, use the colours, but the designs may be not quite as uh, strong. A salutary lesson now for congregations, uh, the hierarchy of the church, and that figure is not very clear, it's a picture over there, and our councils who are entrusted to look after our old churches and the artwork within them. Uh, this is at Birch, just outside um, Colchester, and you can see the church is, well, they're just waiting for it to fall down. But I believe it's still there. In the east window, you have this masterpiece by Mary Lowndes of the Nativity. And it's just a crying shame that with all the millions the councils have raked in through you know, council tax and the Church of England have suddenly found, what, 100 million you know, to pay for the um, food of slavery, that someone could have dipped in their pockets and just paid um, something just to stabilise the church. I mean, 